I'll, I'll just I'll take this real quick uh, and then pass it on. But um, you know, in the past Olympics, uh, and um, I think we had Dina Castor come up to the microphone and say, "Well, today I'm going to blow the field away. Um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm ready to rock, and uh, I'm, I'm fit, and I'm going to take it easy through 5K, and then I'm going to smoke everybody." Well, 5K into it, she broke her fifth metatarsal. She stress fractured her fifth met. Did she did she blame her shoe company on that? Unmentioned. Um, same same Olympics. Uh, uh, Paula Radcliffe, who's had some of the all all time fast women's uh, marathon records, she had a stress fracture in the largest bone uh, bone in her leg, the femur. Did she blame you know blame her manufacturer on that? You know, again, it's 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 not the shoes that are causing the problem so much. It's the way they're landing on the earth. You know, Danny's been trying to get people onto the midfoot for so long because it's a safe place to be. So if you can get that person actually to get under their mass, no matter what shoe they're in, instead of breaking and rotational force at impact, which also shocks the heel as well, now they rotate, it pulls the fascia, now they load up, now they got to push off of the calf hamstring and Achilles and strain the fascia. There's a big, like, you know, ringing effect or torquing effect going on to the foot. They just simply get directly under the mass. So you can get, you definitely have to stretch out the calf group. If you can get them off a high heel, that's helpful too. But remember, it's not going to happen overnight. So using less power and rotation to run, get under the mass, definitely rehab, stretch, and, and, and get the, the calf groups, uh, you know, uh, from so tight. Yeah, and then stop pushing. So. I just want to say one thing. They, um, I think you have to be really careful if they're if they're irritated. So right. you don't want to tell somebody who's got plantar fasciitis go barefoot. Uh, oh, that's yeah. the wrong thing to do. So you need to get them calmed down, and that might be. And you guys have probably some of those devices over the counter, just something to support to give the plantar fascia some relief. Once they've calmed down, then you can start them on sort of a strengthening program, whether that's progressive barefoot walking around the house you know, and then progressing to outside and then minimal footwear and, and, and kind of take them down that path. Do not do that when they're when they're irritated. Mm -hmm. Transition is very important. Critical. From, from going from, from heels to flat. Critical. It's very important when you're selling shoes because that person's going to have discomfort from the cast and their Achilles heel. Yep, sure. Question over here. Yeah, I read you mentioned a similar, uh, similar way uh, using orthotics. What's your view on that um, as far as for in injury fashion. recovery versus, you know, a, a long term. Right. Um, again, my, my, my philosophy about orthotics has changed significantly. I mean, I was really the orthotic queen. I did orthotic research yeah. and for a long time. And, uh, I, you know, I started thinking about it again, like, like the neck and the way we treat every other part of the body. I treat the foot the same way. So if I think the foot needs support for a temporary period of time so it can heal, and it can, you know, get a rest, get a break. I'll clear, clearly put them in something. But in terms of plantar fasciitis, the literature has shown that an over-the-counter device, and this was done by a podiatrist, an Australian podiatrist, Landorf, an over-the-counter device is just as effective as a custom foot orthotic for most plantar fasciitis. So it should be your first line of defense as a therapist. It's my first line of defense. So and you guys have those in your stores, you know. So you can suggest just something like that. So. Yes, I do when I think it's needed. And if I have an individual that's got, you know, arthritis, and I, I'm, I'm not talking about those individuals. There are people who I will make orthotics for who I don't think have very good intact neuromuscular systems. I'm talking about someone who's got an overuse injury that clearly has the strength, the ability, the potential to strengthen that muscle again. Who else? Questions? Right here. Oh, uh, question on the orthotics. Couldn't they make an orthotic with a negative heel? Can they make an orthotic with a negative heel? Why would you do that? Yeah, why would you do that? So it wouldn't cause the lifting of the heel, but it just would still neutral. be a neutral. Yeah. You can get them neutral, yeah. Can I, can I just yep. <laughs> um, Yeah, that's been uh, my specialty for about 30 years. Um, we've been working with elite athletes, and what we found, yeah, and, and tens of thousands of everyday people, but with the elite athletes, we've, we knew when they were coming in, they were more midfoot, forefoot runners. And we never focused on any kind of rear foot rigidity at all. We, we, were chi we were simply looking to balance their forefoot position. A lot of people have forefoot varus or Morton's foot type, short first metatarsal, or true valgus uh, for the rigid high arch supinators. And they will roll off the, the forefoot, 
late stage we just it's a loose term terminology late stage pronation or true uh, four foot supination with that a simple wedge in and out will bring the ground up to the forefoot thus the ankle does not have to adapt again if you land under your body mass the rear foot is out of the picture if you have an ad the ankle will still adapt if you have a forefoot abnormality so what we've been doing at active imprints for the past 30 years is balancing your forefoot with a small amount of support some people then will do better and go on if you get more under your mass or land like chi form completely level and lift there are very little rotational forces as you get into more performance running landing more on your forefoot uh, there could be a brief again because of the unnatural surface hard repetitive concrete there could be a brief rotational force that can be combated just by a simple wedge in the forefoot. So the way we build orthotics all, all of these years is very flexible, very level, no heel pitch, and controlling any kind of forefoot misalignment. That's, and that's been super effective for us. So it's a very, very simple process. And again, a lot of times now, we'll just take a super feet and make sure that their forefoot is balanced, and that will cut down on any kind of late stage rotational problems. Again, injuries are mainly occurred in a breaking moment, a rotational moment, or an impact moment. If we can cut down on any of that, you're less injured runner. I, only add one little, I just want to add one little quick note, and that is the difference um, that I've realized lately is the difference between forefoot landing and forefoot loading. And uh, you want to really make sure that on the group that I was seeing this morning, we were trying to get them to land in a midfoot strike underneath them, but a lot of them were forefoot loading. So it's a difference. You know, if you're running the barefoot, really minimal shoes, you have a tendency to come down on your forefoot because it's natural. Just make sure you don't load the forefoot. May let your total leg relax so that you come into a midfoot strike then. And it is really important because if you're forefoot loading, then you're, you're going to see one of these guys to get fixed. You know, so quick analogy that I think people need to visualize when they're learning this everyone argues do you touch on your forefoot your midfoot it's kind of like the lunar lander coming down you know where something's going to kind of touch gently first but it's going to settle into that nice right. stable position so that loading versus landing I hadn't heard those two terms but that just describes it perfectly but describe to your clients your foot's coming down like a lunar lander it's just it's coming down something's going to touch gently first it's going to settle and that's it. <laughs> that's what you want to teach them. Everything has to be totally relaxed to land that way. And it's not strike. So we so throw the word strike out. No one's striking anything. We're not heel striking, forefoot striking. Right. We're landing. And um, yeah. No, go ahead. That's the total difference between uh, total propulsion, speed. He's going for total propulsion and speed. He is using all his propulsive muscles. When you run naturally, we're not talking about sprinting. That's, that's one component of running. That you're, you're, you're discussing sprinting. And I agree, yeah, you have to have power. You have to have explosion. You have to ground force reaction. You're pushing. You're using all your propulsive muscle to move forward as fast as possible. So they train those, those mechanisms. You notice sprinters have huge legs, right? right? Distance runners do not. If they do it correctly, they do not. You don't want any, any weight below your calf, including the shoe. You're lifting that. You're burning energy to lift. So the lighter the shoe, the better.